Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. So today we start off with the study of Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the longest surah of the Quran. Uh, previously in our sessions, uh, we have seen uh, the basic approach which the Farai scholars adopted in understanding the Quran. And in our last session, we had also studied uh, Surah Al-Fatiha in the light of this approach. Surah Al-Baqarah, as I just said, is the longest surah of the Quran. It's, it, it has 286 verses. And it is a surah in which they are, there is a wealth of meaning uh, hidden. And you'll find as we go along studying this surah that there are a number of issues uh, which have been discussed here. And although they have been discussed in the light of uh, the dialogue which takes place with the Almighty, or from the Almighty with the Israelites or the descendants of uh, Isaac, uh, which of course form the, the first, uh, I would say, line of progeny of Prophet Abraham, uh, to which the deliverance of the message of two, truth was entrusted. Uh, but uh, as we go along this surah, we'll find a number of things which are so similar to the Ismailites or the Ummah, which was instituted in the times of Prophet Muhammad. So there are lessons that can be drawn directly. And as we shall see today, uh, some of the areas in which how Surah Baqarah uh, proceeds forth, how they bring us to a very, very uh, close understanding of people, the way they behave, especially people who are recipients of divine revelation. Uh, once they are uh, given this responsibility, how they have behaved in the past and how this Muslim Ummah is required to learn a lesson from them. So to start off with Surah Baqarah, um, there are certain things that we will first see vis-a-vis uh, -vis the introductory nature of the surah and some of the uh, basic things that we all need to know about this surah. The first thing that we need to know about the surah is the name of the surah. So we have been discussing this before. I have a lecture in detail regarding the names of the Quranic surah and have uh, shown uh, there that as far as these names are concerned, except for the ones which have been kept by God, uh, the rest have been kept by the Sahaba. And it was customary in uh, the times of the Prophet Muhammad that more than one name would be given to a surah. But let us first see the name which God has given the surah. The name which God has given the surah is actually Alif Lam Meem. The word Alif Lam Meem is uh, generally said to be a, 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 an isolated letter. I mean, they are, these are a group of isolated letters about which it is said that no one knows uh, their meaning. But uh, according to the research of Ustaz Hamiduddin Farahi, uh, these isolated letters, as, which are also called the Huruful Mukhatta'at, uh, because they are uh, placed separately and they are pronounced separately, they are actually names of the surah. What exactly is the reason that the surahs have been named such? He has also put forth a very plausible theory in this regard, and that is that uh, these act letters that we find at the beginning of 29 surahs of the Quran. So we have 114 surahs of the Quran. So 29 of them begin with these abbreviated letters or these isolated letters. And uh, in the ancient uh, languages, like the Chinese alphabet, uh, we know that not only letters, they had uh, particular sounds, which we would know them. They also qualified certain meanings. And uh, Ustaz Hamiduddin Farahi has suggested that uh, this meaning that we find uh, in, encapsulated in these abbreviated letters has got to do with what these letters used to represent in olden times. So, for example, he has shown that the word noon used to connote a fish. I mean, the, 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 in ancient uh, Arabic, the word noon, or the letter noon, I would say, connoted a fish. And we know that uh, the surah. Uh, surah Noon, we know it's the 68th surah of the Quran. And in this surah, the, there is a mention of fish, the fish which swallowed Prophet Jonah. And we know the letter or the words are, La takun ka sahib al -hut, which says that don't be like this person who was a companion of the fish. So while trying to console the Prophet that he should not hurry and he should not be in a, uh, in a, in a hurry just as uh, Jonah was. So you see, the word hut is mentioned within the text of the surah, which is, of course, the Arabic word for a fish. And the surah begins with noon. So this was very custom customary in, uh, in the times of the Prophet that 
and then the name of a surah would be kept according to some of the incidents that would be mentioned in the Quran. So this is one example. And another example with Ustaz Hamid bin Farahi has given is that of Surah Taha. So Ta uh, represents a serpent in ancient uh, language, in ancient Arabic language. And we know that the incident of the serpent and Prophet Moses is mentioned in Surah Taha. So the reason that the Surah has been named so is because of the incident which has been mentioned in Surah Taha. Alif Lam Meen. Uh, regarding Alif Lam Meen, he has also presented a, a theory and he has said that how uh, these letters actually represent, for example, he says that the word Meen represents the uh, water wave and that the word Lam actually represents the head of the cow. And we know that the incident of the cow has been mentioned in Surah Baqarah, uh, a little down the surah. And as was the Arab cast custom, that they would name a surah behind a certain a prominent incident or a prominent event that we, would be mentioned in the surah, the Almighty has actually done the same. So taking cue from how Arabs used to keep the name of a, of a, of, of a composition, of a literary uh, compilation, he has done exactly the same. And by regarding it to be Alif Lam Meen, he is actually referring to the incident of the cow which was mentioned in, in, uh, in the surah later on. So this also gives us a very important insight uh, regarding how names were kept in the times of uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, and how different it was from what we have, what our practice is today. So they, today when, when we would write a book, for example, or a chapter, the name of the chapter or the name of the book would always represent or summarize the contents of what the book is all about or what the chapter is all about. But this was not the case in the times of Prophet Muhammad. And uh, so therefore, uh, the Almighty himself actually adopted the same, uh, same procedure and same methodology. Arabs would generally name their compositions, as I said, after some incident. And their, their uh, naming would not be, I mean, it would not cover the summary of what uh, the composition would be about the way we do. So what we do is that always when we write something, the heading or the the title of the book or the chapter always uh, summarizes or basically tells us what's going to be inside that chapter. But of course, this is not the case with the Quran. So the incident of the cow is, is surely mentioned in Surah Baqarah, but in just three verses or three or four verses. So out of 286 verses, which have so many other uh, themes and subjects to discuss, uh, this one incident has been taken and uh, it has become the name of the Surah. So this gives, gives us insight that when naming a surah, we, uh, we should not be uh, led to believe that the name of the surah is going to always cover the contents. Yes, there are exceptions in which uh, the surah, whatever it reflects, I mean, whatever the name says, at times we do find that uh, the contents are exactly the same, but that, as I said, is an exception. So the first thing that we have to understand is that as far as uh, the name of the surah is concerned, its divine name or its, na its name, which was given by God, is Alif Lamin. And the Sahaba actually have, has, have called it uh, Al-Baqarah. And it started off actually by a sentence. So, for example, uh, they, would, uh, they would say something like this, a surah al fi al-Baqarah. A surah in which the incident of the cow has been mentioned. So her whole, whole sentence would be, uh, would be actually, uh, uh, would be uttered to signify that surah. But later on, uh, the rest of the sentence just was dropped and Al-Baqarah remained. So actually the surah meant, or, or the name meant that this is the surah in which the incident of the cow is mentioned. And the sentence, this is the surah in, uh, in which it is mentioned, this part was just dropped and what remained was Baqarah. So the surah got to be named as Baqarah. Uh, you'll find a very similar uh, is the case with Ali Imran. And in fact, Surah Ali Imran, inshallah, when we go to that surah, that also begins with Alif Lam Meen. So we do have similarity of names as well. And this was also customary in, in the times of the Prophet and uh, even before him. So we know that uh, even by in, in naming their children, they would name them as Abdullah 1 and Abdullah 2 and Abdullah 3. Uh, the same name, but separated by you know, 1 or 2 or 3 or Abul or, or Sani and, and, and so on and so forth. So this was something very common. So in, in this case, if it is Alif Lam Meen Bakhara and Alif Lam Meen Ali Imran, the similarity of the name uh, surely we can say it reflects 
the similarity of the content as well. And as we shall see how similar the content of the surah is in certain aspects, uh, it is very befitting that both have been called Alif Lam Mim. So we have to uh, make this assertion that as far as the name of the surah is concerned, Al-Baqarah uh, is the name which was given by the Sahaba and Alif Lam Mim is the name which was given by the Almighty Himself. Uh, these All these abbreviated letters which are found in 29 surahs of the Quran, they are actually names of the surah and we uh, can clearly see this because a surah is referred to this with, by this name in the very next verse. For example, when it's, it is said Alif Lam Mim, Zalika Al Kitab. So it's, it's, Zalika is referring to Alif Lam Mim actually, that this name or this surah is, is part of the book that was promised to be revealed. And as I said, uh, the theory which has been presented by Ustaz Amir Din Farahi, which I've just summarized, is, uh, is uh, I would admit it's rudimentary and it needs to be established further. But however much he has researched into it and found out some of the words which represent certain symbols, they are absolutely correct. But we are not, not very sure regarding a lot of the letters, but the letters which have survived or the name or the signification of these letters which have survived, they clearly show the link between the name and the content or, or part of the content uh, after which it is named. The second important area, uh, my dear viewers, when we study a surah is to find out who the addressees are. And uh, so uh, I have been discussing this earlier on as well that uh, it is essential to know that the Quran is basically a divine sermon which is delivered by the Almighty. And in that divine ser sermon, we have this dialogue taking place between the Almighty and real characters of 7th century Arabia. This dialogue was at times a monologue and something which came from the mouth of uh, God himself. He uttered those words. And uh, of course, uh, we can say that all the words have been uttered by him. But then the ascription of these words change from one person to another, depending upon who is speaking. So we find the prophet speaking in, at times. We find our hypocrites speaking. We find the people of the book. We find the believers. We find Satan. So all of them, they are speaking, they are conversing with one another. So it's basically con divine conversation that we can see. But the important thing that we have to understand here is that this surah has a primary addressee and it also has a secondary addressee. And if we fail to understand these addressees or we, uh, we sort of uh, demarcate them as as something which the surah does not reflect, then we can really interpret the surah with, with serious uh, errors. So if we study this surah as a whole, we'll find out that the primary addressee of this surah are the Jews of the times of Prophet Muhammad. And after him, after them, uh, the believers are addressed. And you can see as we go along the surah that the first part of the surah around the middle and it tells them what they had done as part of their misconduct. They had not carried out the responsibility of delivering the truth and uh, their uh, their breach in of various covenants. So a history of their uh, breach, breaching of covenants and how they made those promises and they went back on their promises is covered in the first half of the surah. And in the second half, we find that uh, the believers who were as a result instituted as a community which were which were to succeed these uh, people of the book of the jews uh, they were given this responsibility and so therefore we'll see that overall it's primarily the jews who are addressed and then after them the believers are addressed but we also need to understand that these believers are they belong to the era of prophet muhammad sallallahu they are right there in front of uh, the quran when it was being revealed and also the jews which are being mentioned here are the jews of the time of prophet muhammad uh, the need to say this is because uh, there are certain things which are specific uh, to the Jews and the believers and all those denominations which lived in 7th century Arabia uh, to which the Quran had uh, has been addressing all of them. And it is essential to realize this. And if we don't, uh, we might end up discussing and, uh, and, and interpreting the Quran with reference to uh, the Jews of today, for example, or the believers of today. Yes, there are certain parallels that we can draw. Yes, there are certain connections. But we have to know that primarily it's talking to the Jews of the times of Prophet Muhammad. And as I said, the secondary addresses are uh, the, the, after the, uh, after the uh, uh, Jews, the, the second primary addressee are the Muslims themselves. Uh, so just as we have these pri primary addresses, we also have secondary addresses of the Surah. And these secondary addresses are 
Prophet Muhammad himself and the idolaters also. So they are also at times addressed. So remember, Surah Baqarah is a, is a surah which was revealed in Medina. And the Prophet had already migrated to Medina. Uh, the truth had been de delivered to the, uh, in a conclusive way to the idolaters who primarily lived in, in Mecca. But we also had uh, the idolaters living in Medina. For example, the Aus and the Khazraj tribes, they of course uh, were the, uh, the tribes uh, which, were, which belonged to the Al-Mushrikun. And so therefore, they were too addressed when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had come to Medina. So he was also at times addressing the, the idolaters of the area of, uh, of Medina. So the secondary addresses of the surah are uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself. As we shall see, he is uh, at times, I mean, at the time, the discourse stops at certain places and it turns to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then starts on with him. And similarly, you'll, you'll find that the idolaters of uh, Arabia are also addressed, in particular, the idolaters of Medina or the polytheists of Medina. Uh, and they are also uh, directly spoken to. As far as the period of revelation of this surah is concerned, which again is a very important area, uh, this period of revelation is something that we have to understand. That is, of course, a surah in which the uh, it was it was was uh, the conclusive communication of the truth which was taking place uh, regarding the Jews and Muslims as far as they were concerned or the believers were concerned they were being uh, cleansed and purified their deeds and practices were cleansed were being cleansed and purified so uh, the Medina period basically can be divided into two broad areas the first area is is uh, or the first phase is the phase in which conclusive communication is being done uh, regarding the Jews and, and the Christians uh, of those times. And uh, uh, once this has been done and, and during this conversation and during this uh, uh, deliverance of the truth to the Jews and, and the Christians simultaneously, uh, the believers are also organized in the form of a separate entity and they are cleansed uh, and the beliefs and practices are, are given the right shape. And once this uh, period ends and ex it's, it extends to a considerable period of time in Medina, we have the phase in which uh, what we call the onslaught was, take, was, was, sought, was thought to take place against the uh, disbelievers of Arabia or the Mushrikun of Arabia. But then, as I said, we will discuss that later. But the period of revelation of uh, this surah, of course, we know that it was revealed in, in Medina. But within Medina, it was revealed in the very first phase, which means that the truth was being conclusively conveyed to the people of the book, in particular the Jews, in such an ultimate manner that they could not deny it, uh, except if they would uh, take excuse in stubbornness. And uh, this was like uh, being deliberately denying the truth. The next thing that we also need to know is the paired relationship between this surah and the next surah. So we know that uh, both these surahs, they form a pair. We have discussed this earlier on, that the whole Quran has been divided into seven chapters. This is the first chapter. Uh, surah Fatiha is the only Meccan surah of this chapter. The rest are the Medinan surahs, Surah Baqarah, uh, Ali Imran, Nisa, and Maida. The next four surahs are all Medinan surahs. And just as Surah Baqarah forms the pair with the next one, which is Surah Ali Imran, Surah Nisa forms a pair with Surah Maida, which is the fourth and the fifth surah. So the first surah is Surah Fatiha. It is a unique surah. It is an independent surah. It does not have a pair. It's an exception uh, in the scheme of the Quran in which surahs are generally uh, found in the form of pairs. So Baqarah, the, so the, the pair of Baqarah is Ali Imran. Now, what exactly is the relationship of Surah Baqarah with Ali Imran? You can see right in front of you on your screens that Surah Baqarah forms a prayer with Surah Ali Imran with regard to the topics which are discussed in both. In Surah Baqarah, the truth is conclusively conveyed or communicated to the Jews and in Surah Ali Imran, besides the Jews, after the truth is conclusively communicated to the Christians in particular, the institution of a new Ummah, the Muslim Ummah, from among the Ishmaelites is proclaimed. So in both these Surahs, uh, the institution of a Ummah is proclaimed, that's of course the Muslim Ummah, and while in the first book, uh, the first Surah, the primary addressees are the Jews, in the second Surah, the primary addressees are the Christians or the Nazarenes. Of course, the Jews are also addressed. But you'll see that there is a special stress regarding or special emphasis which relates to the to the Nazarenes or the Christians, Nasara 
to be precise. And this exactly is also the answer to that question that might have arisen in your minds by now, that why is it that both surahs are called Alif Lam I mean, Both begin with the same letters and therefore both begin with the same name. The reason is that they are so similar in content that both conclusively communicate the truth uh, but the difference is that one is talking more to the Jews and the second is talking more to the Christians. So, so this is, there is a slight difference, but at the same time, the similarity is such that the people of the book, which is, the, they form a single entity, they are the ones that are being addressed. Next, we are going to look at the theme of Surah Al-Baqarah, which is also very important. So the theme of Surah Al-Baqarah is to conclusively communicate the truth to the people of the book. Of course, uh, in uh, Jews in particular, the institution of a new ummah in its place and a mention of its obligations. So, if you look at the whole surah, which inshallah we will do during the course of our study, that this is how the surah mo moves along. This is a single sentence which, which knits the thread between the various needles, so to speak, which are found in this surah. So, if you if you would like to see how a surah progresses, how the surah moves forward. This sentence actually is, a, is it, it summarizes for us what exactly is the theme of the surah. So first, it conclusively communicates the truth, which is of course uh, the uh, translation of the Arabic term itmamul hujjah. It, it does in itmamul hujjah on the people of the book. And once this is done, the obvious corollary to this is that the next people of the book, which are the Shmailites, which are the believers, they are given the responsibility because the previous people of the book, they were not up to performing their duty, so they were deposed. So a new uh, sunnah, uh, a new ummah was instituted, and it was not, not just mere institution. They were also, uh, I mean, they were also informed of what their obligations are. So this is the thread that runs through the complete surah, uh, which you can see is the theme of the surah. So when you study the surah. Uh, you will corroborate the fact that, yes, this is how the surah is progressing. And this sentence actually encompasses the contents of the surah. Next, we see the structure of the surah. Now, this is also extremely important. You see, the longer surahs of the Quran, they are divided into various sections and subsections. And this is something which is not uh, nothing new for us. For people like us who uh, are exposed to, the, to various authors of uh, of a very distinguished, uh, uh, I would say, background. Uh, it's nothing which is different from us because when we see books or when you write books and we study books, they are also uh, very similar. That we have an introduction, we have a conclusion, and in between we have a structural arrangement of contents. In this particular uh, area, you'll find that it does conform to what we are also very used to. So this surah also, in this regard, is something which is uh, it should not be difficult for us to understand. So you can clearly see from the screen that the surah is composed of four sections, four large sections. These are big sections, but it starts off with an introduction. It's a soft introduction. And as the things move along, uh, the Jews are taken to task. So it's not until we reach the first 40 or the 40th verse of the surah that the Jews, which are the actual addresses of this uh, whole surah, they are directly addressed. Otherwise, Prior to this 40th surah, in the first 39 verses, we find an indirect uh, insinuation towards them. And then after we finish these four sections, we have the conclusion, which is composed of just two or three uh, verses in which the prayer uh, that some of you might be knowing uh, is mentioned from the tongue of the new ummah, that once they have been instituted in the place of the previous ummah, which were the people of the book or the Jews, this is, this is how, O oh Lord, O oh God Almighty, we would like ourselves to proceed. So it's a beautifully arranged surah in this regard. And such is the coherence and the structure and the format of the surah that inshallah, as we move along, we'll find how, uh, how well arranged and how coherently its matter has been, uh, has been uh, stated before us. So this is, a, this is a visual presentation of the structure of the surah. So I'm just going to uh, switch my my, my computer to something different so that you can have a better uh, understanding of how these four sections, which pre uh, uh, preceding these four sections, we have an introduction, then we have those four sections, and then finally we have a conclusion. So I remember many years ago when uh, we used to study from Ustaz Amin Asin Islahi, we used to go to him and uh, he would give a weekly, weekly lecture on the Quran as well. And he would often describe 
how his own teacher, uh, the great Ustaz Amir bin Farahi, would reflect on the Quran and how he would be uh, reading it back and forth and how he would be reading a chapter and how he would be reading the individual surah of that chapter and how he would also be simultaneously reading the paired surah. So uh, typically when he would read the Quran or, or, or a particular surah, it would be a reading encompassed in three uh, in three stages or three categories. One would be the surah's chapter in which it is arranged so that you can always refer to the chapter and link it with the theme. Second would be the paired surah or the counterpart of that surah. And the third would be the surah itself. And I remember he used to say that Ustaz Amirudin Farahi would often say that you have to keep on reading a surah again and again to, to really understand these contents. Unless, and I remember he shut his eyes and said, unless you can visualize the surah in the palm of your hand, as if you are, if you, when you shut your eyes, the whole surah is, is picturized uh, in front of you and you can see how these contents uh, are progressing from one to another. So I've just made this uh, uh, visual presentation for you uh, in the light of uh, exactly what I've just explained so that when we go through this surah uh, in, this, in this formation which comes before you in its colored format, you're able to visualize that surah. So you see, this is the first 39 verses are in green. So this is the introduction to the surah. Next, we have this yellow portion, which is the first section of the surah. And still next, we have uh, this uh, light blue uh, section, which is the second section of the surah. You see how it progresses. And then we have this dark green, which is the third section of the surah. And finally, this, this is a longer section. We have this pink section, which is the fourth section of the surah. And lastly, you can see in, in dark blue is the conclusion, which consists of three verses. So this is how the surah can be just simply gone through. Uh, one by one, and if you are able to read it, I mean, I'm not saying that you keep on reading it uh, in, in, a, in a succession, but this is how we have learned from our teachers and how they themselves used to reflect on the Quran, that in order to understand the whole structure and format of the Quran, this is essential that you have the surah in, the, in, in your visual presentation in your, in your uh, back of mind. And uh, precisely this is something which will give you an idea how the things are going to develop in this surah. So once again, you can see th through this visual presentation that what we are doing here is that we are just going through, it's, it's, the longest, it's the longest surah, as I said, we have 286 verses and it's difficult, for example, to have a single slide. But as you can, as you will go along, you'll see that we, we are studying the surah in this, in this uh, sequence that we have, this introduction coming first and then the sections which are right. And, and all these sections are very closely related. I, I'm just going to summarize them as well so that before we begin a formal uh, uh, study of the surah, you first have a, a bird's eye view of the contents of the surah so that once we concentrate on one part, you don't miss out what the rest of the surah is talking about. So now this just brings us to some of the individual sections and introduction uh, which we've just seen. I've just referred to, I've just broadly referred to the visual presentation uh, of the surah. Now you can see uh, from that as far as the, as the details are concerned, that this surah, uh, which is of course composed of these four sections, it's, it has a beginning, it has a conclusion, uh, it concludes. So now I'm going just to, uh, just to give you a very brief summary of how, these, uh, how the surah progresses, so that you can see from, from your own self that these contents, they can be they, they, can, they can catch your attention and in one sentence, which I just said earlier on, that basically it's addressing the Jews and it's enumerating their crimes, deposing them as a result, installing the Muslim Ummah in its place and then informing them of its duties. So this is how it is going to progress. So the first section, of course, this, the first section is not called, the section is called the introduction. It's, it's composed of 39 verses. It begins with the mention of those among its adversaries who shall accept faith and those who would reject it. The idolaters of Medina have been warned that this book of Allah has revealed the truth in its ultimate form. So remember, this surah is also addressing the idolaters of Medina. And I just referred to you that some of them were there, uh, the Aws and Khazraj tribes. A, a large part of them had accepted Islam, but still they were, far, they were there, uh, uh, who were to be addressed and reformed. So it would be extremely unfortunate for them if they are still led astray by the mischievous machinations of the Jews and thus deprive themselves of this great blessing, which is the Quran. And then this introduction ends with a very phenomenal 
finale, I would say. It is the tale of uh, or the incident of the uh, in, in which Adam was created. We know that Adam and Satan, uh, they are figured in that incident. The angels are also there. And if you see that the purpose is to tell the Jews that you look precisely the, the role that you are now playing is no different from what Satan had played with Adam in his own time. So it's like a reflection of uh, what the Jews did. I mean, they're doing and they should see that this is precisely what, this, what Satan did uh, when he was asked to prostrate before Adam. And it was a test for them. And, and Adam himself was also given, made to pass through a test and the, Adam himself were, and, and Eve, uh, they acknowledged the Almighty. But as far as Satan is concerned, he, he, he floundered and he, he, was, uh, he fell short of that test. So the opposition offered by Satan is actually the example of those who were opposing the prophet due to their sheer pride and vanity about their creed and status. So remember, Satan said that he is superior to the rest. And how, why should he uh, prostrate before Adam? This is exactly the same what the Jews were doing in their times. So in the light of this incident, Jews and their supporters have been explained that their malice, that, that their malice and jealousy for the prophet and his nation is exactly the same as one shown by Satan towards human beings. So, and now this first section ends. Now, up till now, the Jews have not been addressed. They have been all been indirectly portrayed certain facts. And this, again, is a very powerful and a very potent instrument which the Quran employs. And we also employ that first, without any, uh, I mean, without any recourse to who's being addressed, we start discussing that person without actually making him our adversary. Precisely this is what has been done here. And now that this has been done, now in the 40th verse of the Quran, which is, which is the first section, I mean, which is the first verse of the first section of the surah, you see the verses, Ya Bani Israel, Uskuru Ni'mat Yallati Aramtu Alaikum. It is now that the surah says, Oh Jews, or oh Israelites, oh people of the book. So you can clearly see how subtle this, uh, this address is and how it goes forward. So this section itself is divided into three subsections. Uh, the section is, starts from verse 40 to verse 121. And within verse 40 to 121, you can see three subsections. So one is from 40 to 46. The Bani Israel have been specifically addressed and urged to profess faith in the Prophet of, of Muhammad, to which their own scriptures so clearly testify. Remember, we know that he is an introduced prophet. They were waiting for him. And the Quran is just reminding them that, look here, you were waiting for, for this prophet and now it has arrived. he has arrived. So why don't you profess faith? So it's like, uh, again, uh, done in a very stern way because, I mean, they didn't need any introduction. They already were introduced to the coming of the last messenger. So in the second subsection, it has been explained, first of all, that a person shall be rewarded in the hereafter on, on account of faith and deeds and not on the basis of his association with a particular family or clan. Because you see, the Jews thought that they are the chosen people of God. And hence, whatever will happen to them uh, may happen for a few, for a few days. Uh, they will say, I'm a Mardudar. But then, of course, uh, paradise is their abode. And they are repeatedly told that this is not so because the Almighty does all his... Uh, Trials and tests and rewards. On, I mean, trials and tests, of course, they take place for everyone, but the reward is always on merit. And the punishment is also on merit. This is what they are repeatedly told. And in the third subsection, they are actually reminded of their history, that who they were, how they had pledged to, uh, to honor their commitment towards the last prophet, and how they were related to Abraham himself, and how, of course, uh, uh, they did not uh, follow what he had uh, asked them to do. So this first section of the surah is actually a build up towards their towards their follies it tells them that how they had uh, had progressed in as, as an ummah and how they now are showing themselves as, as, a, as some something as, or as, a, as a mass which so poorly instituted regarding its responsibilities the second section and now this second section actually covers the part of abraham's life which relates to the building of the baitullah it must be borne in mind that when Abraham had started to build the Baytullah, he had prayed to the Almighty to raise a Muslim Ummah amongst its progeny and a prophet among them as well. So basically, once the charge sheet has been given uh, against the Jews, the history of their, of their own ancestors is presented. And remember, the Jews took a lot of pride in associating themselves with Abraham. And now Abraham is mentioned, and they are told that, look what Abraham had said. He had prayed that a last prophet should should be uh, should be sent from amongst his progeny, the Ishmaelites, and so remember that this is what what he did. And if you associate to him, if you think that he is your forefather, then you must not forget 
that he had predicted or prophesied the arrival of the last prophet in the Ummah. And as you reach verse 139 and 140, which is uh, round about here in the second section, you will find a shift in the surah. And now slowly the believers are being addressed. Once the charge sheet had been given to the, uh, to the Jews and they were told that they had breached their promises, they had gone back on their commitment uh, regarding their, their, own, uh, their own promises and also their association with Prophet Abraham uh, regarding which uh, he had predicted the arrival of the last prophet. And as a result, they were to show respect and honor that last prophet. They have again gone back to them. Now they don't deserve to remain in that position. So it's like in verse 140 to 141, uh, you find the shift and you find the, uh, the arrival or the announcement of the arrival of the last of the final Ummah in the words of Kazalika Jalnakum Ummatam Wasatan, which means that in this manner, just as we have changed the Qibla, of course, this is another topic which will be discussed in the Surah, just as the Qibla has been changed, now this responsibility is given to you, O believers. So here you find the Surah taking a decisive turn. So uh, now we move to section three of the surah, so, which is uh, it covers from verse 122 to 162. And of course, uh, from 162, uh, from verse 122 to 162, uh, you can see that the purpose of narrating uh, the whole surah or the depiction of the whole surah is in, in, a, in a way that the distortions which had been, uh, which they had uh, presented, and also as far as these distortions are concerned, they, they were distortions in which you'll find a lot of things were common to them. And these common things were, I mean, there were some things which, which the Quran has told them when the new Ummah was being instituted, that that they recognize this prophet the way an estranged father recognizes his, his son. They know that this is what the truth is. But in spite of this, they uh, have persisted to deny so, I mean, this is something which really takes the surah to a special pinnacle. It takes it to a zenith in which their charge sheet is first presented and then they are deposed. And in the third section, so it's such a beautifully arranged surah that once they had been deposed, now this new ummah is, is given their place. I mean, it's, it's instituted as, as people who would now deliver the same responsibility. And now some of their obligations are narrated to them and they are given some of the directives. And in fact, these directives are, in, in most cases, they have been revived. They were already present as an established sunnah of Abraham. But of course, these directives are given in a certain sequence so that once again, Muslim Ummah is reminded of its, of its uh, obligations. It is told that, look, the, you have just seen the charge sheet. You have just seen the follies of the previous Ummah and how they made a mess of the responsibilities and how they associated themselves to Ab Abraham and did not listen to what Abraham had said regarding the last prophet. Now that they have gone and you are in, in, in their place, do remember that these are some of the, the, some of the areas of Sharia which are being revived. And they were present in the previous Sharias as well. But one by one, these directives are revived. So we first get the directive of Tawheed. Then we have the prayer and zakat been mentioned. Then we have kisas and diyat being mentioned. Then we have the uh, leg legacies and wills being mentioned. Fasts being mentioned. Prohibition of bribery and wealth obtained through illegal means. Hajj and then jihad and infaq on account of the relationships of the latter two with the former because at that time the baitullah was under the control of the idolaters. So you see, hajj in those times was, was especially related to jihad and infaq because now Muslims have, were living in Medina and they had to liberate the Holy Kaaba from the custodianship of the Quraysh. So this is a special uh, introduction to this background that this jihad and this infaq is with relation to your association to the house of God because you have to go there, have it liberated from their clutches and then do hajj. Then we have the prohibition of intoxicants and gambling, permission of incorporating the affairs of your orphans and their guardians and, and prohibitions of marriage among idolaters. And ninthly, we have Issues like marriage, divorce, ila, khula, uh, razaat, uh, and of course, some of the other things. So you see, in a sequence, in this third section, once Muslims had been given the responsibility of, of taking the place of the people of the book, now they are being reminded of these responsibilities that don't forget that, yes, some of these uh, uh, directives already existed. They were there in place, but now they need to be revived and you have to understand them. Next, we go to the fourth section. In this fourth section, the topic of jihad and infaq 
which was which actually began with the previous uh, section is brought to a completion why because there were certain questions which had arisen in 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 that section and jihad in faq could not have been completed in that section and this also gives us a very uh, a, a very unique insight in, regarding the quran and that is how people had a living relationship with the quran i mean it was it was a it was a book that was being revealed as circumstances were proceeding so the quran's intention was to go and present its i mean its next topic but once it presented the uh, questions arose regarding what it had already presented so it talked about hajj it talked about infaq it talked about jihad and as as it did so people started to ask questions so the quran stopped itself here it's like almighty said okay wait here i'm going to answer the questions first and then take up the discussion once again so exactly this is what has happened here that there were questions which were unfinished uh, questions regarding jihad and infaq because the fact that uh, so certain questions had arisen in the previous section so the almighty started to answer those questions i'm i'm doing it a bit uh, i mean in a, in a very uh, brief way because you see some of these questions i'm not going to cite here uh, we'll study them one by one but just to give you an, uh, this this idea that at times the almighty or the quran is going along and it has its own plan but then when it sees that people have questions it stops there and it first takes up their questions and if you have uh, i mean studied surah bakara uh, a couple of times you will not fail to uh, to get reminded of the fact that there is this uh, yonder of questions which is asked one after the other yes aluna ka maza yunfikun yes aluna ka anil mahiz yes aluna ka anil ahilla which mean that they ask you prophet about this they ask you about infaq they ask you about the courses of women they ask you about the the uh, the forbidden months so you see this these questions are narrated and once they are i mean finished the topic which was originally uh, being discussed is is brought to a closure this is precisely what has happened in, in section 4 as you can go along the fifth section or the, i i can say after these four sections we now have the conclusion in which now the umma is given this responsibility in the form of a prayer it is said that yes they have been deposed you are now in their place this these are some of the directives that have been given and once this these have been given you will not be able to fulfill these responsibilities unless you have god by your side so that beautiful prayer which with which surah bakara ends farfu anna waqfir lana warhamna anta maulana fansurna alal qaumil kafirin on which the surah ends is a prayer it's a supplication which is uttered uh, to to the tongue of this newly instituted muslim umma so that they are make, so that to make them realize that in spite of all their efforts unless they have god's help they would not be able to succeed so dear viewers uh, this is uh, a brief summary and also how the sequence within the surah has been followed uh, inshallah we'll start off uh, with right from the first verse of this surah the next time we would meet which is of course after the month of ramadan uh, this particular talk or lecture was meant to introduce the whole surah to you its background its content its theme its addresses Uh, of course how we are going to see that its period of revelation ref is reflected within the sura and remember we had discussed this that whenever you would like to know about the period of revolution of a sura you don't need to look outside the sura you just need to study the sura and you'll find within the sura strong indications as to which uh, segment of the prophet's mission or the prophet's era in medina does the sura belong to so this brings me to an end to this uh, discussion of introduction inshallah as i said next time we start off studying the surah from verse number 1 if you have any questions regarding this introduction uh, please put them forth assalam alaikum uh, dr shahad and uh, my regards to all the participants here on behalf of everyone here i want to thank you dr shahad for your insightful lecture today um, and i truly feel that we all have gained a deeper understanding and learned a great uh, perspective to approach surah bakara uh, so without um, holding or taking long, longer i would like to invite the participants to um, have question and answer session so first question is from mohammed mohammed please unmute your mic and um, ask your question uh, i have an observation it's not a question uh, in the uh, lectures uh, before the last when we discussed the arrangement of the quran there we studied that uh, in the first chapter which is from surah Uh, number no, number one to five, there were only two phases. One was the commissioning mm -hmm. of the prophet, and second was the tazkiy or tathi. But today, right. uh, when you were discussing the phases uh, in this Surah Bakara, 
اتمام حجت واز آلسو انکلوڈیڈ تو از اٹ سم مائی مس انڈرسٹینڈنگ اور دیر از سم چینج نو ایکچولی تسکیہ از اینڈ تھیر از اٹ ریلیٹس ٹو مسلمس اینڈ کنکلوسو کمیونیکیشن ریلیٹس ٹو دا پیپل آف دا بک سو دیر ار جسٹ ٹو سائڈ آف دا سیم پکچر اور دا سیم کوائن so uh, in the initial uh, lectures i was saying that uh, the medinan period has uh, uh, this this uh, these two divisions that muslims they are i mean they are cleansed of their uh, evil practices their 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 positive practices uh, are made to develop and at the same time the people of the book the truth is conclusively con- conveyed to them so this is like a single phase in which one thing is happening with the with the muslims or the believers and the other thing is happening with the people of the book so this is the first phase the second phase of the madinan uh, ministry of the prophet is the uh, phase in which the attack or the final onslaught was launched so this is the first phase and both uh, all these four surahs they belong to that phase in which the truth was being delivered to the people of the book in a conclusive way and the tazkiyah and tathir of the muslims were taking place so basically they are the same i mean one is being done with the people of the book and the other is being done uh regarding the muslims uh th- that's correct uh, but i think then i what i had prepared a slide uh, in this regard i need to correct that because in that right. slide itmam hujjat is not included in chapter 1 okay so chapter 1 itmam ul hujja and cleansing of beliefs this is this is actually the same thing and uh, if you would like to just amend your slide it's basically a one thing uh and it reflects i mean it's like a single phenomena Uh, which has two sides okay thank you up next is uh, navid irfan mera sawal ye hai ki jaise aapne bataya ki surah ali imran aur surah bakra dono ka shuru alif lam mim se ho rahi hai jo huruf e muqattaat hain to ye kyunki surah ke naam hai to dono surah ke kyunki mauzu ek hai to allah ne naam ek rakhe hain aur lekin aage bhi kuch surah mein aisa hai ki kai surahon ke mein ek hi huruf e سیملر تھیمز از ویل Thank you. Adil, please go ahead. Um, unmute your mic and ask your question. Ji, as-salamu alaykum, Dr. Shah. Wa alaykum as-salam. Sir, this is the verse of the verse of the verse of the verse. There are a few, uh, uh, there are a few uh, uh, comments that I saw uh, made by people online uh, that uh, this is aya is exactly seems to be in the middle of surah al baqara and this uh, is a miracle that how can you place the ummatun wasat the middle umma aya right in the middle of the surah as well so this must be a divine scripture uh, what are your thoughts about uh, comments like these uh, is this something that one should consider as plausible or uh, is this just uh, something to i think uh, this this is some this is just a coincidence that has happened there is nothing which relates to the miraculous nature of the quran so the quran does not uh, represent or uh, ever say that its miraculous nature is uh, dependent on these numerals or these uh, chance happenings it says that its mir- miraculous nature is uh, uh, you can see it says law kana min in the ghairillahi la wajadu fi ikhtilaf in kasira had this quran been authored by someone else than god there would have been a lot of discrepancies in this in this book so the real miracle of the quran is it's free from any discrepancies and this is how the quran itself is presented its own uh, miracle and i think that is how we should also discuss it uh, the the fact that there are subtle or certain uh, i mean accidental chance happening in which verses occur in a certain way or maybe as you said that this is the surah which is exa- i mean this is the verse which is exactly half and it's also the middle and the, the ummah itself is the middle uh, I, these are just chance happening i would say or uh, these are all points which which have no significance as far as understanding a surah is concerned or uh, even understanding how the almighty made a particular surah to be something which just cannot be emulated and this is what is called the ijaz al quran or it is a mujiz something which uh, human kind is is unable to come up with i also had a couple of additional questions so i guess i can ask them now uh, 
um so the uh, so there was one more thing that you uh, mentioned the other day uh, sorry um, when you said that quran has given a specific uh, meaning um uh, to a word uh, and a typical arabic word but uh, for instance after quran it has uh, attained a special meaning out of all the other meanings mm-hmm. ये जो लफ्स को जामा पहनाना या खास जामा पहनाने वाली बात है ये उस दूसरी बात से क्लैश नहीं करती है जहां पर हम कहते हैं कि तो लसान अरबी मुबीन में नाजिल हुआ है जहां पर अरबी का जो कॉमन मीनिंग है उसी को कुरान लेके चलता है आगे ना कि उस मतलब को कोई और जामा पहना पहना देता है i mean people just come up with those meanings as uh, as rare occurrences as people would say well this word also means this so this is uh, something different it just tells us that the words are, are used in their conventional conventionally thought meaning so that is one thing which the quran claims the second thing is that while going along with the first uh, premise that these are uh, commonly understood words and they are not uh, rare and unique representations this is the next step which the quran takes and it it uses some of these words in a particular connotation as a term and it becomes a, a specialized word within the diction of the quran to give you an example uh, if you look at iqbal's poetry the, the word shaheen uh, is depicted in in a very specific way now the word shaheen of course is is it's, it's, it relates to a bird it relates to uh, someone i mean an animal that we know but Iqbal has has taken the same Shaheen and he has given it a new meaning in a very similar way what the Quran does is that it uses conventionally understood words i mean in, in a conventional meaning and then it uses them in certain specific connotations and people know that these are specific connotations so that's for example the word al-mushrikun so the word mushrik in in its common connotation always refers to the polytheists as to people who uh, intentionally uh, associate partners to god but when the quran uses al mushrikun it's not using it for the hindus or people uh, of religions that also commit polytheism it is in fact using al mushrikun for the bani smail or the ishmaelites so this is how a word is i mean at times it's, it's a common arabic word now that common arabic word which has a general i mean everyone knows its meaning it is it is lifted up in the in a particular background and the quran assigns it a, a term and a sort of a meaning which makes it a term so these are things which keep on happening uh, in all languages and people who are linguists they know that how a word progresses and at times uh, uh, that particular word which has a very common meaning ultimately it crystallizes in the form of a term right so mr mr akhri sawal last lecture se related tha jisme iya ka nabudu aur nabudu ka in dono mein fark आपने ये बताया था कि इया का पहले आने से उसमें कुछ जोर पैदा हो जाता है कि हम आप ही की इबादत करते हैं या करेंगे और आपके अलावा किसी की इबादत नहीं करना चाहते इसको अरबी में हसर कहा जाता है ये हसर है या कुछ और कॉल्ड मफूल मुकदम इट मीन्स दैट ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द वर्ब इज प्री पोज इट्स आई मीन द नेचुरल पोजिशन of an object इज ऑलवेज आफ्टर द वर्ब सो द मफूल ऑलवेज कम्स आफ्टर द the fail the fail comes first and then the mafu uh, comes this is the general order uh, of an arabic sentence but when the mafool comes first uh, mafool is called the object and the verb is of course the fail so whenever the mafool or the object precedes the verb uh, this is a general practice in which i mean the purpose of the speaker or the author is to emphasize a particular thing so iya ka nabud would mean that only you we worship whereas nabudaka would mean we worship you so the word, the stress of only you is added by preposing uh, the object or the mafool uh, by placing it before the verb right so thank you thank you um assalam alaikum dr sabin thank you for the lecture uh, so i want to go back to the um huruf muqaddad or the unconnected letters um and just you know kind of try and understand the the theory that mm-hmm. you uh, share So the Farahi theory is that in root languages, uh, letters were denoted by symbols, and Alif, for instance, was drawn as a cow's head. Um, and as you mentioned, chapter three also starts with Alif Lam Mim, but there's no cow there. So you know how how do we understand that? And also, you know, I mean, as was just being discussed, 
Quran tells us that it was revealed in Arabic and you know in the dialect of the Quraysh so why would it mm-hmm. borrow from the root letters in Hebrew and why would it be so unknown in early times so that's you know with regards to the theory which came from Farahi and then Islahi kind of you know took it further and said that these unconnected letters are names of surahs um, and in that case you know shouldn't there have been you know shouldn't that have been known in the early islamic history i mean we have accounts of the time when osman was compiling the one copy of the quran which in fact was a project which started in abu bakr's time wouldn't we have accounts of hearing the companions refer to this chapter as alif lam mim instead of al baqara so we do have these references for example the companions calling it as alif lam mim al baqara we do have uh, such references so uh first let me just tell you this that as far as uh, uh, naming a surah is concerned uh, it was a much later uh, opinion that has become so famous that uh, uh, these letters have uh, i mean we don't know their meanings only god knows their meaning otherwise if you look at some of the hadith literature uh, the hadith literature is very clear when it cites certain surahs uh, it cites in a way that uh, it is referring to their names and the fact that these are names of the surahs is is also not a unique opinion which is put forth by farahi and islahi this opinion is also something which is reflected in the earlier works it's only that because of the fact that the earlier works they don't concentrate on a single meaning of an interpretation what they do is they would just uh, uh, present before you multiple uh, interpretations and therefore you just uh, tend to get lost uh, as to what the actual interpretation is so otherwise as far as uh, this interpretation is concerned is not it's not something which is unique to farahi the uniqueness which farahi has presented is that why is it that uh, when you, what exactly is the significance of the word alif lam mim i mean what is the meaning of the word uh, alif lam mim that is his contribution but the fact that these are names of the surahs this is not his uh, uh, i mean original contribution because a number of exegetes have presented this in their tafsirs that these are in fact names of the surah so this would be similar to for example if i say that what exactly is the meaning of usman or abu bakr so i of course would uh, try to find out what exactly the meaning is but if i am not able to find out what the meaning of usman or abu bakr is there is not going to be any i mean nothing lost from our knowledge in a very similar way we know that alif lam mim or the rest of the 29 let huruf uh, muqattat which are found in 29 surahs they all are names of the surah and what exactly is the name of a surah is is, a, is an additional information just as if you don't know what the word usman means or abu bakr or umar means it doesn't take anything away from your knowledge because anything after uh, any the, the real thing of comes after this so his contribution is that he has tried to show that if arabs actually kept this name and all the almighty took you also in uh, keeping this name then what exactly uh, is the meaning of this word also i would like to check double check here that the word lam and mim both have been referred to uh, by ustaz amin hasan islahi i might be just uh, confusing them because one of them the word letters means uh, the water wave and the other letter means the head of the cow so lam and mim is is like uh, need to just double check from mr tafsir because one of them means the head of the cow and the other one means the, the water wave and as far as your question is concerned that what exactly uh, is the relevance of uh, al imran being named alif lam mim now that is a very interesting question i would say and uh, as yet we i think i would not be able to answer it because uh, we still have uh, alif missing uh, as our i mean we don't have exactly know what it it means uh, it, or it used to mean in asian languages so maybe when we see alif lam mim uh, being mentioned in in surah al imran uh, there could be some other i mean grouping of these letters which could give us a new picture but that is essential i mean that can only be done once we are clear about all the uh, i mean from all the letters of the alphabet are clear to us that this is exactly uh what each letter stands for because that is uh, something that is still not fully uh, verified i would say uh, scholars from our institute they have tried to write articles they have tried to fish out some of the missing meanings of some of these letters but as yet uh, i don't find them to give a satisfactory answer so basically farahi's theory is 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 a very plausible theory but it needs a lot of uh, further confirmation before it can be fully accepted but if these were you know meanings which were understood at the time of the prophet and the companions why would there be so much mystery around them why would there be such a there wide is no, spectrum I mean, of there, there, is, there is no mystery you see what has happened is in today's world you find that mystery 
because something has become dominant and the, the dominant understanding is that there's we don't know the meaning of these these uh, letters this is just one one interpretation that has become so famous so if you go back and look at uh, our uh, i mean uh, our early scholars you will find that they are i mean they are talking about the fact that yes that these are names of the surahs uh, something which is very commonly talked about and it is only in uh, in later time that the some of the other interpretations started to, to receive dominance and that is uh, that we don't know the meaning or, or exactly the implication of these letters also we have to understand this that in the earliest uh, uh, tafsirs also and in the earliest conversations with the prophet this has never come up i mean this was never questioned uh, another important thing is that had these been unknown the quraish would definitely have i mean they would they would not spare the prophet they would have definitely asked him that what exactly is he talking about why is are these surahs opening by such words so had this been a contentious issue Uh, it would definitely have been a, uh, an objection that the quraish should have raised and they never raised this objection and the sahaba also seldom talked about them which uh, it was as if it was already understood the, the only thing is that why is it that this is the surahs are named in such a fashion that uh, sim- i mean letters which are not connected which are disjointed they are used as names so faraiz is contribution is just to to uh, to theorize that what, what exactly is the meaning or connotation but as far as the name itself is concerned as i said if you le- read the earlier scholars and earlier tafsirs you'll find that this is something which was well known to them okay thank you thank you any um we'll take the next question from um, tariq jawed assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam uh ji dr sahab i have some question regarding the upcoming uh, sessions uh, firstly i believe uh, there will be no session during ramadan and my question would be uh, what's the like a blueprint of like how many ayats approximately we shall be studying in each session uh, like that if we're talking about ramadan so we'll be uh, looking at passages of the quran every day so it's like a 30 or 40 minute session is going to take place inshallah from the first of ramadan uh, but if you're talking about the surah baqarah and how we will uh, start to study it I, um, it's difficult for me to say the number of verses uh, that we are going to study each time but uh, i mean think it would become evident from the first few uh, sessions how how we are able to move along but if you're talking about the ramadan session as i said we will s- select from the quran uh, important passages which deal with self improvement okay but uh, then is it possible like uh, that before the start of the session uh, we get a message like uh, in the upcoming session we'll be uh, studying these verses so that we can do some advanced reading on that uh, those verses i think so we, we we can try if uh, we we will we surely try if it is possible uh, because this is to be done every day so might not be possible uh, every time because i do the selection on the spot i mean what i mean on the spot is just just before starting the session so it might not always be possible but we'll try as much as possible to let you know and uh, uh, the structure of uh, uh, the study would be uh, fol- following the uh, sar gamdi's uh, 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 structure that uh, he groups uh, various verses into paras like every para has like 2 3 4 5 6 7 verses so, so we shall do well, actually our format would be that we will be uh, studying some of the quranic verses and deriving uh, its message vis-a-vis our own personality and character development and uh, and enhancement of our spiritual fodder so it would be i mean it's not it would be more of a spiritual reading of the quran in which instead of concentrating on its uh, grammatical or its uh, linguistic aspects we would be concentrating more on the message mm-hmm. so so uh, i mean uh, um, there are many uh, verses uh, in the quran which uh, sargamdi philosophy that some of them are not applicable today uh, they were applicable to the people at that time so we shall also be highlighting uh, such differences while we no we will not be because you see when we are talking about uh, uh, particular passages which deal uh, with self improvement these are passages which have a universal appeal they are not specifically related to a- any particular group of people or to any particular time here so these are like universal uh, message uh, bearing passages 
So, so, so our, our, our focus would be like, what is the guidance for me uh, or for us? Right. Uh, right. Uh, in, in the, this, that is correct. This, uh, how I can become a better person, uh, how I can become a better person uh, by, by, uh, by understanding the basic crux of the message of this particular set of verses. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that would be an excellent idea. Okay. If there are no further questions, then inshallah, uh, we'll resume this study right after Eid. And uh, inshallah, during Ramadan, we will be looking at the Quran in a different way. And inshallah, hope to see you all all the way soon.